On the heel of a strong earnings report and after making the massive acquisition that effectively doubled the size of the firm, OpenTech CEO and CTO Mark Berenche joins me to talk about how this quarter turned out, how the macro economy is affecting the company's business, and why the microfocus deal is key to unlocking its next wave of growth. All this and more, you're tuned in to Making Markets. This is the Making Markets Podcast, brought to you by Futurum Research. We bring you top executives from the world's most exciting technology companies, bridging the gap between strategy, markets, innovation, and the companies featured on the show. The Making Markets Podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Please do not take anything reflected in this show as investment advice. Now your host, Principal Analyst and Founding Partner of Futurum Research, Daniel Newman. Mark Berenche, CEO, OpenTex. Welcome to Making Markets. Dan, pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I've been following the company for a long time. I've been really excited to have you on Making Markets. Company's doing a lot of interesting things, and we're going to dive into that throughout this conversation. I do want to start with something that I don't always start when I'm talking to my guests, but... When a company is growing as large as yours, doubled in size, I believe, in the last quarter through some really strategic and organic, uh, usually everybody's like, yeah, I know what it is. You're a PC company or you're a chip maker. Open Text is an information management company, or that's kind of how you self-prescribe. How do you explain when you're at the Thanksgiving dinner table and someone's like, hey, okay, Open Text, big company, what do you do? Yeah, we do a lot of things and and we, we deliver a wide range of outcomes. So look, we started as a search company uh, and then went into managing the content behind search. And then over time, we expanded the content that we, we, we manage uh, from experience data, operational data. Uh, we've gotten into supply chain data, and now we're getting into IT uh, automation and, and IT data as well. So we call ourselves the information company. We manage, secure, provide insights to big unstructured data. Uh, for uh, enterprises and small, medium-sized businesses. So um, th- that's what we do. Uh, we'll, we'll work with your unstructured data, provide you insights back. And by the way, that's a, a, a massive undertaking for most companies yeah. because while we often focus on systems of record that have very well-defined and structured data, I don't want to downplay those that do that, but that is an easier problem to solve. It's easier to create consistent schema, and then you know it's easier to utilize that to drive insights. But with things like the rise of IoT and Edge and all the data that's coming from sensors and environments, companies have a big challenge to say, how do we utilize that data in our decision making? And you know, despite the fact that you know, I know all this generative AI hype, you can't just ask Bing. You're gonna need, <laughs> you're gonna need better systems than that. So. Um, you know, let's let's talk about the quarter. So you just recently came off a really, uh, you know, strong earnings uh, coming into a, this is a tough macro, Mark. I mean, it's not an easy environment. I'm watching big companies that people depend upon missing. And, yeah. you know, I think you guys showed some really solid resolve. Talk a little bit about the earnings and the highlights. Yeah, look, it's, it's a very um, unusual market out there, Dan. And I've, I've tried to find a word to describe it. And my best word is it's uneven. Uh, And it's not where all boats are rising or all boats are um, retracting based on the tide. Um, Is that certain uh, companies who have invested over the last couple of years um, into continued digitalization, supply chains, uh, 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 security and trust are seeming to do better than others. So it's a very uneven market right now, given the uh, inflation, uh, gi- uh, given the, the war on talent um, and, and many in, in uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. For us, um, you know, we, we've been uh, tripling down on our cloud technologies and our cloud grew revenue 16 percent uh, last quarter. The total company grew 8 uh, percent revenue. We had fantastic uh, efficiency uh, and margin at 38 percent adjusted EBITDA. We busted the rule of 40. Uh, uh, with uh, yeah, 38% adjusted EBITDA and, and 8% growth. So um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're in a, a very good lane helping customers digitize, collaborate. Uh, we have one company who literally sells bicycles in the hallways, uh, automating contracts and grants. And we've moved that to fully digital now. 
Um, so yeah, we had a we had a strong quarter and, and a continued strong outlook um, uh, here in the first half of uh, calendar twenty three. And I'm glad you talked to kind of the unevenness, Mark, because yeah. I wrote an op-ed in Market Watch recently, or actually a couple of them, and I've taken this exact comment. I think the last time I did Squawk Box, I went on and talked about what's old is new was kind of the whole thing. And I didn't mean it in a cynical way. I meant it in a really positive way. Is a lot of the what are kind of legacy technology companies that have been, you know, either building hybrid or on-prem architectures are seeing a bit of a, a renaissance right now as companies are trying to figure out how do we maximize our current IT investments? You know, going to public cloud has a uh, component that's definitely uh, well understood of value and scale. And, yeah. and, and, and at the same time though, uh, I think people understand there is a lot of cost to lifting and shifting into the public cloud. Not all workloads are benefit. And I think that's why I've kind of gone on record saying hybrid architecture is the winner. Hybrid architectures will win because it's financially, economically, operationally the most sensible. You call it cloud an operating model. Well, the operating model has to be financially sensible. So speaking of sensible and financial. Yes. If you, Dan, if I can understand yeah, underwritten laws in the universe, and yeah. one of them is 42, uh, like, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the, uh, uh, to the Universe, 42. It is 42 months where I've seen this for years. We've done the math inside and out. At forty, if you're buy, if you're consuming enterprise software, it is more economic to buy a license if you're going to use it for more than forty-two months. Beyond the forty-two months, clouds become more expensive. Now, you may not have the skills you need to go to cloud and subscription, but economically, a license is more beneficial at forty-two months or greater. Well, does this now have we just defined the rule of forty-two to cover? Yeah, there you go. Forty on the show, so we've got the rule of forty-two. Yeah, uh, Mark Baron Shea's rule of 42. It could be the cover. I see a cover of a book. Uh, maybe someday after you retire, I think you can write the book of 42. A new Hitchhiker's Guide. Well, I, I've definitely seen, you know, we've seen companies like um, 37 Signals and Basecamp and JP Morgan have kind of come out talking about why they're repatriating. And again, that's not the focus of what you're doing because you're kind of trying to manage the information across the, the chasm. So whether people are in public, whether they're on prem, whether they're hybrid, you're trying to give them the tools and technologies to manage and secure uh, and utilize and, and all the data. Uh, and you made a big bet this last quarter. I mean, it wasn't this last quarter you made the bet. It was a few quarters back, but you announced and officially closed the acquisition of Microfocus. This, to me, seems like a really a watershed moment for the future of open text. That was a big bet, I think, effectively doubling the company. Talk about what this means for open text and for your customers. Yeah, sounds great, and th th thanks for the opportunity to, to, to talk about it. I mean, as you know, as you noted, the world is hybrid, and those who say it's going to be all cloud or all—I don't call it on-prem; I call it off-cloud. Uh, still, with a cloud m mindset, um, it's, it's not going to be in either of those extremes. It's going to be hybrid. It, you know, hybrid is that des uh, destination. But as companies bring on more and more workloads in the cloud uh, or off-cloud. The operations get a lot more complex. You know, how do you integrate all these systems? How do you keep identities consistent? How do you secure them? How do you bring the, the information together in a supply chain when you're talking to 50 systems? So that's where we, we come in. And the strategic rationale behind MicroFocus is we've had the information components because all companies are information companies. MicroFocus had the components to help companies become software companies. And we believe everyone's going to be an information company and a software company. So by expanding our mission again in information management to digital operations management, doubling down on enterprise security, application automation, we can deliver a much bigger mission to our customers and continue to expand the definition of information management. And as you noted, in near uh, double the company, we're, uh, we put our projections out there for the next uh, few years. Um, um, approaching over 600, uh, 6 billion in revenues, um, very efficient in, in high EBITDA and high cash flow, 25,000 experts strong, and seventh largest pure play um, a software company on the planet now. So, um, uh, but we've, we've expanded our mission of information management and uh, where companies may have the process advantage from ERP, now they need the information advantage that we think we can provide. And of course, you're really kind of, jumping and riding the wave of, of 
you know, systems migration with, you know, with micro focus. I've been on the record countless times saying the mainframe is not dead, but you will see significant workloads moving off because of public cloud. So I think you're trying to meet that perfect spot of being, hey, we want to be the company that helps you get to that right workload, right place, really holistically. It's not just about which cloud, it's about everything from mainframe to prem, private cloud to hybrid to public and having that whole spectrum and being able to help companies deal with it. Um, and, I, and I like that. I, I, heard, I was with the CEO of a major bank last week. Yeah. And he's a former COBOL programmer. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about, you know, um, uh, he, he made it very clear. The bank is not moving off mainframe or COBOL. It is the most reliable system for um, a transaction processing. When it comes to yeah. money, uh, various calculations, it, 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 it's, it's a, it is a foundational technology in the enterprise. Yeah. Um, and so is EDI. And we're, we're, we're the market leader in EDI of how commerce works over the yeah. internet. Yeah. We're, we're, we're delighted to uh, be a leader now in mainframe technologies, COBOL, EDI, because of the backbone of enterprises. And we'll surround them with, uh, with more, um, um, you know, current uh, uh, internet technologies. Well, there's a customer angle to this, Mark, and but you're basically saying is we, you know, I, I know, I think it was Andy Jassy and always talked about this at AWS before he became CEO of Amazon, which is AWS. He always just kind of said, we want to meet the customer where they are. And sure. when you kind of have that whole continuum, though, that's really what you're doing. You're you're living that sort of word of saying, yes, we understand enterprises really where your data lives, really where your systems live. It's it's all over the place. And frankly, it's a bit of a mess. I mean, it's really not an easy thing to unwind. So as you're trying to unwind all that, um, you know, I'm a big M&A guy. I'm a believer in M&A. I'm actually in the process. I've made four acquisitions in the last seven months of uh, research and data companies. Um, so I'm a believer. You know, not everybody is. Some people believe that when you can't find organic growth, you grow inorganic, it's because you don't have enough people. I don't buy any of that, by the way. But integrating companies is hard. Open Text has grown by doing that. Give me the quick snapshot in your role. How are you making these, these integrations work? It's one thing to acquire companies, it's another thing to integrate them into your culture and make them successful. Yeah. Well, it's um, we've done over 80 acquisitions as a company in our 30, 30, 33 year history. And it's part of our of our business model. Look, my my shareholders uh, expect the return on their capital. They expect me to drive tax efficient structures, and to get a high return on invested capital and, and strong cash flows. So um, we believe that we're going to put our capital to work. Um, I think you said it very well. We're going to meet the customer uh, as to as to their needs. We're very customer centric in our innovation. So we look for open spaces, uh, either technology. Um, or uh, or customer sets in the context of our strategy. Uh, we look for a financial return. We, we take a very unique view that it's through a cash lens, right? If, if, I, if I'm going to spend a dollar, I want that dollar back in five years. <laughs> and okay. if I can't get that return, we're not going to be interested. If it doesn't fit our technology, we're not interested. We can't make the culture work. But the key word for us always is integrate. Integrate, integrate, integrate. Integrate the technology, integrate the sales force, integrate the operations, and it's through that integration that we ultimately yield uh, the uh, uh, the customer value on the innovation and the shareholder value on the return. That's, by the way, not easy to do. Um, I've built uh, through acquisition, and in many cases, I end up doing more of a you know, you almost set things up and structure divisions because it is so hard. So you should really feel pretty accomplished. And I'm obviously uh, getting these companies, the size, scope, scale, and, and culture, by the way, Mark, is always one of the hardest things. Yeah. It's kind of smash two cultures together. And, and that really takes having a vision that people can all get behind. I mean, it's never like, hey, we acquired you and we integrated you and overnight it's all one thing. You'll always see a little bit of team red, team blue for a sure. while. But when you kind of really can, everybody can really say, hey, that vision, I can get behind that. That's when you see culture start to mesh really quickly. And by the way, through acquisition, through growth, through product, through software, you, you've been able to acquire quite a quite a <laughs> prophetic customer base, right? Uh, you know, you've got 80% of the Fortune 500. Uh, and, and you're a very, you know, hands-on CEO from what I've gathered. 
What are you kind of hearing from these big global customers right now? How are they thinking about the market? You, of course, are doing great, but I don't know that that's everybody right now. There seems yeah. to be a lot of stress about what's coming. Yeah, uh, maybe just one word on the on the culture piece than what we're hearing in the market. I mean, you, you nailed it. It's about purpose. And uh, 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 I don't address employees. I address my colleagues. And so we talk about our shared purpose um, 25,000 experts, colleagues strong. Uh, and uh, we talk about how we help customers. Uh, we talk about our purpose. How do we advance our skills? Um, um, so it's a, it's a shared purpose. And that's one of the most important things of creating a high performance uh, culture. There's a lot going on in the world today. And, you know, you go back, uh, I call it BC before COVID and now AC after COVID. Um, you know, as we entered COVID, it was the fourth industrial revolution, and that was just heating up. COVID was an excel accelerant to it uh, and created, you know, new work paradigms. And here we are, right? Uh, coming out of the, um, uh, um, the disease will be with us for a long time, uh, but socially it, it's, uh, it's over. Um, inflation, top of mind. H how do you control cost? It's got to be to automate. Um, supply chains are completely revamping around the world. Uh, and with respect, people are, are bringing supply chains back home. Um, they, they don't want to be beholden to a government. Uh, they want uh, more regional control. Uh, so there's just massive supply chain work. One of the biggest pieces of work, Dan, that we're doing right now is security and trust. With Russia's war on Ukraine, commercial companies are asking for DOD level security. We have commercial customers in the U.S. looking to be like a bank or like the DOD and have FedRAMP um, uh, level security. And we're seeing that all over the world. Data zones, trust, compliance, just up like a, like a rocket ship. So inflation, um, uh, new exploration of energy, uh, supply chains, and security and trust are driving demand for us. So... I like that you kind of pointed out what's driving demand. I like that you pointed out some of the inhibitors. Uh, I agree. I think there's a CPI reading actually today. I, I didn't hear what it was yet. Um, did you happen to catch it this morning? I only saw a quick headline that uh, uh, prices uh, increased more slowly, but they're still high, but they increased okay. a little more slowly. So I'll have to watch when market opens in a handful of minutes. Uh, you know, obviously you're probably not watching this show in real time with us, but we are. We're doing some real time exchange I, here. I focused on you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, and I appreciate that. Me too. I I, I typically have CNBC running on my monitor over there, uh, but I turned it off because I'm I'm like a squirrel. If I have too many things going on, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to flash away from you. But I'm I'm really you know I'm really engaged here. I'll tell you what the supply chain thing. You know, we do a lot of work in semiconductors. Yeah. So I was countlessly speaking to the media about this and repatriation of, of parts of our supply chain is going to be imperative. The, the, the chip uh, supply chain is incredibly complex and the parts that comprise oh, yeah. it will never make it, we can never fully repatriate, meaning we still build stuff here and then have to ship it back to Vietnam for some, I mean, it's a, it's a bit misleading that we're going to take everything back here. But the fact is we offshore way too much of our and created uh, just a disproportionate dependence on, on places that we have no control over. And it was pretty scary. I don't think people realized how close to call it <laughs> things are at times because, you know, we don't watch the news. We watch TikTok. And so hopefully we're up leveling all of our desires to read and pay attention to the world. But it's good that people like you are. Now, yeah. the, the and to this, point, this is a very real issue and it's going to be with us for a while. You look at the supply chain of a chip from from just silicon to the machinery uh, yeah. that that creates the, the, the glass and the, and the subsurface yeah. uh, to the rare earth minerals. I mean, before you even get to manufacturing, there's a big supply chain before you're pushing a button in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, yeah. uh, that a lot of this stuff is com coming, uh, you know, coming back home. I'm so glad you said that. I, I, uh, I was on, um, I can't remember if it was Bloomberg or CNBC, and they were asking me just recently about ASML because the Netherlands joined the chip control. It's like, there you, go. you realize this is the only company on the planet that can, can, can do this advanced lithography. And so... If you can't get those machines, you literally can't build these these five and three nanometer processes, which means you can't build the most advanced semiconductors for AI, for mobile yep. devices. Uh, so, and people don't realize that one company in the world, in the Netherlands, builds this machine. And if they don't build a machine, it doesn't matter what AMD does or Intel does or any of these companies, they're 100% beholden. It is crazy 
that we let that happen. But uh, hopefully we're going to find solutions for that um, in, in the coming year. As we sort of wind down at the end here, one of the things that came to my attention through reading your earnings was that cloud growth for companies like yours that are supporting cloud from a very holistic standpoint, it's not slowing down. So while some of the public cloud numbers have seemingly uh, decelerated a bit, that's not your case. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have companies like Salesforce, Salesforce and Micro, they've had galactic growth and they've, look, they, they, um, they invested in, in very large growth and now they're just down to interplanetary growth. Even though their growth has slowed, it's still like interplanetary growth. And we've gone from planetary growth to interplanetary growth. So we, we've been raising our growth and even though other companies have come down, they're still big growth numbers. Um, so as you noted, we grew 16% in our revenues uh, last quarter in cloud, driven by supply chain, driven by security and trust. And um, we're, uh, our, our forecast for the year is still 15% plus uh, cloud bookings growth uh, here in fiscal uh, fiscal 23. And um, uh, so we're, we're excited about going from low single digit to mid single digit cloud growth. And we, we expect that to continue. Yeah, I would say overall, there's very little indication that cloud slows, but I think the architecture of cloud and what it means in the enterprise continues to evolve. Like I said, there was a pendulum, everything's going public. Yeah. Uh, that's not the case. And so the definition of cloud's evolving. Oh yeah. We, we do public, we do public SaaS stuff, right? Real important. Or we have a big private cloud business. Um, we have customers who don't want to be in shared instances, uh, uh, they want their private and they want all the benefits of what look like SaaS, but they want to do it in their own private environments, given their integrations and their data. Uh, Dan, we've also built an API business. Um, so all our major pieces of functionality are also consumable via an API. So we've gotten into the embedded app space uh, as well. Uh, so our cloud is, is public cloud, private cloud, and an API cloud. So as we, as we wind down here, Mark, you guys refer to something as information advantage. I, I feel like without getting an answer, I could possibly describe it, but I'd love to just kind of hear from you. What do you mean when you when you say information advantage? Yeah, re real simple. And you noted it at the beginning of our, of our conversation today. ERP providers are fantastic at managing transactions. You know, I, um, I you know, wind the clock back 20 years. There were a thousand ERP providers, um, uh, Bond, JD Edwards, the JBOPs, if we remember the JBOPs uh, from way back when. And GNA used to be like 20% of a company's expense. And through automation, the process advantage uh, through ERP, companies, you know, automate their, G, uh, their GNA today. Well, now they have all those transactions and all that unstructured data. Let's get the information advantage out of it. So um, build a great HR process and give me your 100 million CVs so I can find the best patterns of talent. Uh, hand me your billion invoices and uh, war work through your best suppliers and build supply chain towers for you. So you'll get the process advantage from ERP, but we want to get into that data uh, and get insights into all that transactional and operational data and experience data and provide you insights. And that's what we call the information advantage, not just the process advantage. Yeah, absolutely. So Mark, I wanna thank you so much for tuning in. My favorite last, uh, you know, my favorite last thing to ask every CEO that joins Making Markets is always, what is the street, the investor, the market, in your opinion, not understanding or missing when it comes to how they evaluate open tax, if there was one or two things, what comes to mind that you would really like to see the market better appreciate that yeah. the company is doing? Well, we've moved quickly here over the last year, uh, and we just doubled the size of our company uh, uh, over the last three weeks. And so, appreciating the scale uh, of, of the of the our expanded mission at Open Text, understanding our cloud growth. You know, we we weren't born cloud. We are reborn cloud uh, and understanding the, the cloud and understanding the capital engine of the company. I, I've, I've spoken uh, on our earnings um, about uh, when, we were, uh, when we complete the integration, uh, we'll, be one of the, we'll be upper quartile free cash flow. And at the end of the day, we believe for shareholders, the value is the cash flow we can generate. 
uh, and we'll we'll be generating in the uh, uh, in the twenties uh, percent of free cash flow yield. Um, and uh, our three year projection is over one point five billion in free cash flow generation from the company. So size and uh, the, the scale and the importance, cloud growth, free cash flow. Um, um, and I think as folks, uh, as investors understand better the power of that capital engine, um, uh, everyone will be rewarded for that for that hard work. Yeah, it allows you to keep that cycle going, finding and identifying uh, targets, making yeah. acquisitions, integration, scaling those respective businesses, accelerating growth. And so that engine is a virtuous cycle of yeah. reinvesting back into the business or, returning yeah. it, or, or, or having a higher capital return strategy. And that, that free cash flow is the ultimate creator of that opportunity is that you can put off the cash to be able to give you so much flexibility non-dilutively in many cases to be able to do things yeah. to keep your investors happy, keep growth coming. And of course, as I always say, organic growth plus inorganic growth, you know, and you're al already showing over 40, which is a really great result for a mature company. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll get you close. You're getting close to rule 50. You know, <laughs> I want to bring you back. I want to let's keep smashing the rule of 40. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, no pressure here on, on making markets, Mark, but, uh, you know, at, you know, rule 40 or 46, I think this quarter. So, you know, uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with pushing the envelope. You got the rule of 42. Now you got the rule of 46. <laughs> Let's keep pushing. But, uh, Mark Berenche, thanks so much for joining me here on making markets. I look forward to having you back in the near future to hear how things are going. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to making markets. Enjoy what you heard. Please subscribe to get every episode on your favorite podcast platform. You can also watch us on the web at futurumresearch.com slash making markets. Until next time, this is Making Markets, your essential show for market news, analysis, and commentary on today's most innovative tech companies.